we are ready to start chapter 12. And the name of this chapter is Open Closet Doors Carefully. Sometimes things fall out. As mom reads, I sketch the scene. Harry sneaking down the hallway on a midnight search. I practice drawing perspective, angling the lines of the corridor narrower with each door to pass. I imagine David turning the doorknobs, needing to know what's on the other side, not even realizing the walls are squeezing in tighter and tighter the farther he walks. I flip my page to save him. Beside me, my word cards sit upside down on the waiting room couch, a tiny white pile. At home, I felt ready to share these words. But what if Jason tells me I'm being selfish to feel bad for me when David and he has it worse? And now, much for shipping, or and how much for shipping? The receptionist asks, the phone to her ear. Is there any discount if we buy two boxes? I yank the zipper open on my backpack to find a blank card. Maybe I have time to make new words before Jason gets here. That does seem a lot for one box of hearing aid batteries, the receptionist says. I lay a card on my sketchbook, but before I can choose a word, Carol rushes through the clinic doorway, her baby balanced on her hip, and there was such a line of traffic on the bridge, she says over Jason's head to Mrs. Morehouse behind her. Figures that have to raise it for a ship on the day I'm already late. Excuse, I write the word quick as I can. That's always the way, isn't it? Mrs. Morehouse pushes Jason's chair across the carpet toward me, and Mom picks up her bookmark, leaving Harry still, searching in the hallway. Jason smiles, his hair curling along his forehead and above his ears, no longer dangling past his eyebrows. Your haircut looks good. I slide my word pile words pile under my leg. Two, short. He nods toward the card in my lap. What? Word? I frown, sliding excuse into an empty box pocket of his communication book. With no picture, the card looks rushed and cheap. My fingers itch to pull it out again. I'm sorry, I say. The rest of the words I brought aren't good words. Want bad words. Not that kind of bad, I say. A grin sneaking out. I mean, I was upset when I wrote them. Maybe I could make double for next week. He shakes his head. Want those words. I glance to mom, but she doesn't look up from her magazine. And how soon can I expect delivery? The receptionist asked into the phone. Maine? Jason stares at me, touching an empty pocket in his book, his finger tapping a soft drum beat. I pull a card from under my leg not even looking at what it is, I reach across the slide and slide the word into a pocket of Jason's communication book. Murky. What? Drawing murky. What did I draw for murky? I ask. He nods. I wrote that word for a feeling, I say. But a feeling isn't always drawable. So I drew the pond where I go swimming. There's a raft and we dare each other to jump off and touch the bottom. You have to go way down and the water gets ice cold. But the worst part is when you touch, 
the bottom's all squishy with old pine needles and mud that sucks your feet down right to your ankles. By then, you're almost out of air and you start thinking maybe this time the mud won't let go and you won't make it back up. But the rule is that you have to bring back a handful of that murky stuff from the bottom to prove you made it all the way down. I expect disgust on Jason's face, but I see something else. Wishing is, with a question mark, fun? I nod. Coming up makes it worth it. He sighs and I realize he'll never feel the thrill of breaking the surface. Fist raised, mud dripping down his wrist. How can someone live a whole life and never feel that? You said you write murky for feeling. Jason taps. What happened? Question mark. I reach down to finger the word cards beside me. You know, Christy, my new neighbor I told you about? Well, on Tuesday she came over, which would have been great, except Ryan came with her. He's the boy I can't stand. David wanted some of Ryan's gum, but Ryan teased him and everything was ruined. And the first part, I whisper so mom can't overhear. David thinks Ryan is his friend. He doesn't understand. Ryan's only making fun of him. I add the words fast. Cruel, tease, embarrassed. And I get stuck making it better when it all goes wrong. Hate. Unfair. Beside me, little yellow white sand grains cling to the wheels, to the wheel of Jason's wheelchair. I wipe them away a few at a time and watch them disappear. Too tiny to see fall. So I felt like that. I touch murky. Stuck at the bottom of the pond, only this time the mud wasn't letting go. Sometimes, James hesitates, his fingers held in the air over his book. I wish die. Oh, don't say that. Mrs. Morehouse startles. What's wrong? I look from Jason's finger on secret to Mrs. Morehouse sitting forward in her chair. He just surprised me, that's all. I flip through his pages to find words. I would miss you. Mm, Jason smiles. But why wish I? He shrugs. No word. Frustrating. Most. I roll one last a sand grain, perfect and sharp, between my finger and thumb. I am, he turns the page in his book and points to, incomplete. No, you're not, but I know what you mean. Sometimes I don't feel whole either. I find an empty pocket for torn I feel like I'm ripping in half, one half wanting to run away and be a regular person with my friends, but my other half is scared to leave David because he can't make it on his own. Make word, please. I open my backpack and reach for a blank card. What do you need? Leg, go very much fast. Run? 
He nods, and I scribble the letters, leaning forward, rushing across the top of the card. Jason taps. Sometimes, asleep, I dream, I can run. Really? He nods. How does it feel to run? Strong, I struggle for the right words. And fast, and in a weird way, weightless. Like if you could go fast enough, you'd fly. It's an amazing free feeling. I squeeze my toes, imagining the slap of my sneakers on the sidewalk. Is that how it feels in your dreams? No. He looks away from me, his lips pressed together. How could I bring these words to comfort myself when they put that hurt in his face? I could push you around the parking lot really fast. I joke. That'd be close to running. Jason taps. Okay. My smile freezes. Okay? Sure. Why not? Question mark. Out the window, a man in a gray sweatshirt walks down the gift shop steps. A woman opens the door to Elliot's antiques, and a family comes out of the restaurant laughing. Between the rows of parked cars, a seagull struts, looking side to side. Because there are cars out there and tourists, I say, and seagulls, you can watch out for car. Jason smiles. Bird will move. I don't think. Tell mom. I'll be right back. He stops his finger on please. I pull in a shaky breath. Mrs. Morehouse, Jason and I are going out in the parking lot for a few minutes. We're going for a run. I say the last part extra quiet. A what? She looks up from her magazine. A run. I step behind Jason's wheelchair and push. It rolls smoothly, easier than I expected across the carpet. Do you really think this is a good idea? Mrs. Morehouse asks as we pass her. I can't see what Jason taps, but... She moves to open the door. Be careful, Catherine. She fixes me with a stern look. I grip the wheelchair handles as we go down the ramp, my muscles tight as rope. My palms feel slick, but I don't dare relax even one finger, afraid he'll roll from me. At the bottom of the ramp, we both let go, a relieved sigh. I turn the wheelchair to face the parking lot. If this gets too wild, lift your hand and I'll know to stop. Okay? Jason nods. Run. I jog more a fast walk than a run. Jason's head and shoulders sh shake as I bump him over cracks in the tar. There's so much to watch out for holes and rocks and sand near the side of the building. I stop beside the dumpster. Sorry, this is such a bouncy ride. Are you sure you want to do this? Run fast, says Jason. I start again, pushing Jason. I start again, pushing Jason's chair ahead of me. I run past the fire hydrant and around the parking sign, keeping a lookout for cars pulling into or out of the parking lot. Every few feet, I shoot a lightning quick glance at Jason's hands. He doesn't pick them up, just holds tightly to his communication book. So I make the first turn, running faster. Clouds of seagulls take to the air in front of us, quarreling and shrieking. 
Running hard now, my feet pound the tar, the flap of seagull wings as loud as my breath in my ears. People are looking, but I try not to see them as real, just statues to run past. At the final turn, I see Mrs. Morehouse standing in the entrance to the parking lot, her palm out like a traffic cop, keeping cars from pulling in. I dash past the mailbox, the exit here sign, past Mrs. Morehouse, leaning into it faster, harder, my feet slap the pavement until it comes. That weightless, near to flying fastness. Do you feel it? I yell to the back of Jason's head. But if he answers, it's only in his head. I run all the way to the climate or the clinic ramp. How was that? Awesome. I bend over to steady my breath. When I straighten up, I see not only is everyone in the waiting room standing at the clinic windows watching us, but a family on the sidewalk is staring, shopping bags in hand. And in several of the restaurant windows surrounding the parking lot, people have stopped eating to watch. Most of them have their mouths dropped open. Jason waves. A man in one of the restaurants gives a thumbs up, and everyone in the waiting room cheers. Carol holding her baby high so he can see. One more time. One more time, I ask Jason. He grins. Excellent. And we're off past the windows and the dumpster, around the parking sign, seagulls billowing into the air at every turn, strong, flying, fast, and free we run. End of that chapter. <laughs>